a cold February night in 2008 outside Anchorage, Alaska, a man was filming the Aurora Borealis. It was a spectacular show, but the vision he'd remember would not be in the sky. He packed up his gear and headed down the mountain. He encountered a woman coming up. Miss? Miss? Miss, you all right? He would later describe her as looking zombified. Miss, can you hear me? Hey! He headed down and reported what he saw. Could the light show above have caused the woman's strange behavior? Bizarre stories have surrounded the Aurora Borealis throughout time. Legends claim it makes people act violently or even become self-destructive. Why did this woman wander into the wilderness? And where did she go? Whatever the cause, she was reported missing that night and never seen again. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go missing in Alaska. straight up so you know it's going to be nice and treacherous. Let's do this. The team begins their investigation on the northeast side of Anchorage, trekking up the mountain where the missing woman, Stephanie, disappeared. So this is a popular hike, huh? It's a good spot up here to see Aurora Boy Alice. Man, this is a tough climb. Hey, guys, this is the exact trail that Stephanie was on. Turns out they found her whole house, the TV on. Meat was in the sink, being thawed. All signs indicate she was coming right back. And, uh, you know, she was an experienced outdoor enthusiast and should have been experienced in these areas. And I don't like to presume this about people, but when I hear Stephanie's story, the first thing I think of is possible drug history or maybe mental problems. She had no history of either, but those would explain what happened. You guys rested up enough? Yeah. All right, yeah. get up there, man. Let's do it. <sighs> That's pretty steep. I know every native group here in Alaska have their own stories of what the aurora is. Uh, some definitely more sinister than others. The aurora borealis, also called the northern lights, occurs in high latitudes where particles from the solar wind hit gas molecules in the upper atmosphere, creating a brilliant display. For millennia, the Inuit believed the lights were lanterns of demons pursuing lost souls. The Fox Indians believed they were the spirits of slain enemies rising to get revenge. Others saw them as a positive omen. Vikings in Europe thought them to be Valkyries coming to lead fallen soldiers to their final resting place. Whatever the interpretation, the lights were seen as a powerful force from beyond our realm. But down in the southeast, where I'm from, uh, the Tlingit people believe that the Aurora is were warriors that went before us. It's their spirit. Uh, that's where they, they've gone. And also, when it's, when it's red, um, that there's imminent battle in your future. You're going to be probably warring with other tribes in the area. 
The correlation between the Northern Lights and imminent disaster has continued into modern times. In World War II, the lights were spotted just before the London Blitzkrieg. And when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the Northern Lights were seen as far away as Ohio. More recently, Aurora Borealis preceded the massive earthquake and tsunami that rocked Japan in 2011. But does correlation equal causation or just coincidence? The belief that the auroras signal danger comes from the idea that spirits can see into the future. They see danger coming, and they want to warn people about it. But some people believe that the auroras themselves actually cause danger, that they affect people and make them act in aggressive ways. Now, that's a scary thought. OK, it's getting real steep again. Oh, almost there, guys. After a really tough hike, we finally got to the peak where we could get a really clear view of the awesome Aurora Borealis. <sighs> oh. Whoa. Oh, it's so rich. Oh, wow. That is badass. At the top of the trail, I decided to get some EMF readings under the Aurora Borealis to see whether I can even read electromagnetic energy from this distance. Huh. What do you got there? Oh, oh check it wow. out. Hold me. Whoa. Electromagnetic energy right there. I'm getting some unusually high readings here. What do you make of that? Still going, man. I don't know. What's interesting to me is that on the night that Stephanie disappeared, conditions were very similar to tonight. A very active aurora borealis display. And the auroras have radiation that's invisible to the eye. When you think about the dangers of radiation, from simple sunburns to cancers that people get from cell phones, I'm wondering if the aurora borealis can affect people in ways that we just don't understand. Wait, wait. Hear that? What do you hear? Kind of a light buzzing noise. You guys can't hear that? Snap, crackle. The noise I'm hearing is very soft, but it's also very distinct. It's like having a bad electrical wire that you can hear through your walls. No, I don't hear anything. I just feel a little lightheaded. Well, that's not good. I think we need to get off this mount. Head down? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Right. It's impossible to know if Stephanie was in her right mind that night but witnesses said that she had a glazed look on her face. This correlates with the native legends saying that the auroras can alter our perceptions. Some Inuits even believe that watching the auroras too much can make it go mad. Maybe what Jackson Ken were feeling were symptoms of that. After their strange experience viewing the Northern Lights, the team decides they need to learn more about this phenomenon and see if it can affect human behavior. Ken and Tommy are meeting with Todd Salat, a scientist and photographer who's an expert on auroras. Come on into the wow. art cave. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah, beautiful. Very Thank impressive, you. Thank Todd. you, guys. It's kind of my life work here on the wall. Basically, what happened last night was we were getting an enhanced stream of solar wind buffeting the Earth. Hmm. And here's a model, a plasma ball, where the inner red core there, that represents the Earth. And those wild rays coming out, that's our magnetic field line. And this ball would be our magnetic shield. The magnetic field deflects most of the solar wind, but some of it comes down our magnetic poles. And those electrons, when they make a connection with the Earth's atmosphere, they start lighting up. That is a pretty concentrated dose of energy. The electrons, however, and the charged particles, they're not making it all the way to us because we have the atmosphere, which is very thick. So the, the energy coming down through the Earth is not going to affect the animals and us? I don't think so, but maybe you've heard of the HARP program up here in Alaska. Uh, there's a lot of secrecy surrounding that. So you're talking about government? It um, is, a, yeah, I believe, a government facility. HARP. The name stands for High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. It's an array of 180 antennas that beam electromagnetic waves into the ionosphere. Located near Gakona, Alaska, HARP's reported goal is to find ways to improve radio communication through the upper atmosphere. But could the enormous amounts of radiation be affecting the people in Alaska? At different wavelengths, 
Electromagnetic energy can cook food or even fry electronics. What could it do to the human brain? I do believe they're sending energy from the ground up as opposed to you know what might be a little bit more natural aurora energy coming in from above and not really reaching the Earth so much. So it's like creating the auroras from below? Something that can you know simulate that same effect of the aurora? Yeah. Maybe that's why Jack's heard the buzzing sound and I got lightheaded. I certainly can't speak with any kind of expertise about what's going on there, but there might be some actual health hazards that we don't understand real well. Todd's revelation about the HARP program was frightening. If HARP is putting out high levels of radiation, it could potentially affect people's brains and possibly their behavior. The old practice of electroshock therapy is a very similar principle. Maybe there is a connection to Stephanie's disappearance. Well, maybe we need to look into this HARP thing. That sounds interesting. Yeah, check this out. The Northern Lights have long fascinated the people of Alaska. Legends about the Aurora's power pervade native folklore. But is there a sinister truth behind the tales? Could a version of these lights be affecting people like Stephanie and contributing to the rash of missing in the Alaska Triangle? And could that version be man-made? A connection has been made to Harp a secret government outpost first built in 1993, which is reported to study the effects of radiation beamed into the ionosphere. This is their official brochure that they put out. And the way it's worded, I mean, you can't really understand what they're saying, what they're up to. And the internet is flooded with conspiracies about that place. After making the Harp connection, we began to follow that lead. Tommy reached out to Harp in order to request a tour of the facility. Well, I got online and downloaded articles about the organization from the internet. I don't really know the science behind all this stuff. There's probably very few people that honestly do, you know? Well, how could you? They make it almost unreadable. Ken and Jax go to meet Dr. Nick Begich, Jr., an activist and author who has spent the last two decades working to expose HARP secrets. Hey guys, good to see you. Ken, we're hoping to get more information from Nick about what HARP really is and whether, in fact, it poses any type of threat to the population. Can you kind of explain what HARP is and, and how it works, the science behind it? Sure. It is essentially a radio transmitter, but it's not like a single antenna radio transmitter. And when you think about radio transmitters, um, the energy from a transmitter comes off of the, the source point, spreads out very rapidly, and so it becomes less and less dense with distance. So the further you get away from a radio tower, the, the weaker the signal. Sure. With HARP, it flips this around. 180 antennas fire in a specific sequence, causes the energy to focus, creates what's called a cyclotron resonance, which if you could visualize this, it would look like a corkscrewing uh, motion of energy that gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it gets higher and higher and higher. So the further out you get, and the stronger that focus, then you're able to affect environmental systems. The description that Dr. Begich is giving matches what Ken and Tommy heard. Focus energy might excite particles in the atmosphere, which might show up as artificial auroras. We've heard that they can recreate the auroras, is that true? There, the, there is a way to create um, a lighting effect, but what HARP is all about is weapons applications, um, weather modification being, being one of, of many. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy stuff, it's man. It's scary, too. The idea of using weather as a weapon sounds pretty wild, but even if HARP is doing something as simple as heating pockets of air in the sky, like a microwave heats food, that would affect pressure differentials in the atmosphere, which in turn would alter wind patterns, affect cloud formations, maybe even trigger a violent storm. Do you think that something like this, the, the energy, the auroras, would have some type of effect on humans? It can do exactly that. You and I can pick that signal out. The brain will lock onto it, like dialing in a radio station. Like we could hear something beamed into our brain? The right signal will affect you on a cellular level. You could calm the population or agitate them. The issue of mind control, I'm gonna demonstrate that here in a minute for you guys that just kind of illustrates the transfer of sound directly into the human being from something other than the ears. Nick pulls out a device that he says is gonna demonstrate remote effects on the brain in a safe way. But I've got to admit, I'm rather nervous about this. What's gonna happen is the sound's gonna come in through these two transducers. So block your ears tightly so you can't hear anything external. So I want you to hold that in your hand. Touch his hand. 
Ooh, God. that's weird. <laughs> So Nick does this demonstration where he's able to somehow resonate music into my head from Jax's body without any music playing out loud. This is really weird. And then the idea of, of taking the jump from this to a wireless version of this, harp could be utilized in that way. Any part of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, can be pulsed, manipulated in specific ways to couple with the human body and create these kinds of uh, consciousness effects. And mostly so, theories, or do you think this stuff is? These done? aren't theories. These, if, if anyone who's read my work, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of source documents cited. You can look at the 2006 protocols for the Navy. We're moving away from bombs, bullets, and ordnance towards mind control. Using those words is right in there. These are pretty unusual claims that Dr. Begich is making. I mean, hearing music in your head is one thing, but full-on mind control where someone's making you do something that you don't want to do, that's a big leap for me. Dr. Begich, some of the information that you've given us has really <laughs> kind of set us onto an interesting path here, so. Well, thank you for covering the story. Appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. After Dr. Begich's frightening accusations about Harp, the team is left to ponder their next move. Wow. That was crazy, man. You know, I'm always up for a good conspiracy, but I kind of thought, well, I mean, what he's out there preaching about seems a little out there for me. Yeah. I Let's mean, call Tommy. And... Yeah, you need to fill him in. You're right. Hello? So we just got out of the meeting with Dr. Nick Begich. It was pretty crazy. If the military really is attempting to control people's minds using energy, I mean, how sinister that is. Yeah, that doesn't seem Surreal, man. Have you been able to reach anyone over at Harp? I left several messages there with them. Well, let's keep trying. We need to see that place. The idea that an external force can control one's mind may seem far-fetched, but Jessica Duncan believes she experienced just that while on a solo hike through an Alaskan forest. A couple years ago, I was out bird watching a favorite place of mine near Fairbanks. Uh, I was tracking a pair of downy woodpeckers when Something changed. I felt compelled to look up at the sky and something about the way the clouds moved was eerie. And then suddenly I was filled with fear and panic. I just started running. There was nothing behind me. I don't know what I was running from. I can't really explain it. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. When I kind of caught my breath and started to calm down, I realized I was utterly lost. Thank God I had my compass. I was exhausted and I was miles from the road. Quite honestly, I don't know where I would be if I didn't have my compass that day. Anxious to get a first-hand look at the Harp facility, the team plots the best way to get there. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Gakona is here and the harp facility is about eight miles outside of that we still haven't heard from harp and online there are reports saying the facility is shut down but we still want to check it out so we decided we're going to go up there and have a look even though we don't have permission i'd be real interested in taking some readings because i think you know if they're technically shut down then we shouldn't be getting any right of course readings on any instrumentation or something let's get out of here yeah? We think that a covert investigation into Hart might give us some insight into what happened to Stephanie and some of the other missing people in Alaska, as well as answering some of the questions raised by Dr. Begich. It's a risk to go there uninvited, but it's a risk we've got to take. Alaska, a land of massive mountains, immense forests, and huge numbers of missing people. More than 3,000 per year are reported lost in this vast expanse. Could some of them be victims of mind control? The government-run HARP facility is known to pour massive amounts of radiation into the skies, and they're not alone. Similar facilities have sprung up the world over. Japan, China, India, Norway, Brazil, Peru. The list goes on. The original version, Sura, was built by the Soviet Union in the early 80s. Like HARP, they claim to be studying radio waves in the upper atmosphere. But some people believe their true goal was spy technology. 
with Sora able to eavesdrop on any wireless communication around the world. With similar claims being leveled at heart, the team wants to know what's truly happening at this secret facility. Okay, yeah, it's looking by a sodometer here, we're about two miles out. The possible effects of a facility like HARP are pretty frightening. A study in Russia showed that a rise in geomagnetic activity, which causes auroras, translated to a rise in anxiety, depression, even suicide. Is that what Sura was trying to duplicate? Is that what HARP wants to control? It's important we find out what's going on here. You know, I'm assuming this is open. They've got surveillance all around, cameras, audio, everything. So we think about one of us sitting in the car while the other two of us see if we can get on foot as close as possible. And... So we're talking about a getaway vehicle? Yeah, in a sense, huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. We're here, Ken. This is Harp. Holy I don't see any signs. Hey, a light just came on. You see that? Oh, man. A different line turned on right there by the edge of the building. Yeah, this is creepy. There's definitely some activity here. All right, guys, what do we do now? Guys, I think we're here. Might as well take some readings. I want to okay. get as close as we can. Sounds good. Tom, come over and switch seats with me. Everything I've heard about this place is extremely unsettling. I'm really not sure what to expect at this point. I think, I think we might have spotlights up here. Let's just be prepared for that. We know that HARP was designed to emit electromagnetic radiation, possibly across all different wavelengths. So we're going to use our EMF to see if that's happening. Jax. There's actually a sign that says that this facility is controlled by the United States Air Force. It's top secret, no entrance. Oh, what's that? Oh, dude, it's redlining. Check that out. This thing is not off. It is not decommissioned. These electromagnetic surges that I'm picking up with my instruments could, in fact, indicate that HARP is broadcasting some kind of rays into the atmosphere. And this, in turn, could be affecting the surrounding environment. Yeah, I'm getting crazy readings, man. What other readings can we take while we're here? Uh, I've got the spectrometer. We can do some audio frequency readings here. Well, that's interesting. We're getting, we're definitely getting a spike. Oh, you're gonna have to help me. What's that mean? It means we're getting some type of audio wave we can't hear. That's how mind control works, man. As Nick Begich said, they align pretty much with brainwave activity. All right? Yeah. Well, I say let's, um, let's do the drone. Yeah. Let's get that part done. Yeah, but check it out. We got all these power lines here. Yeah, no we, can't, we can't fly it here. Let's step back like 100 yards. That'll work. Are you OK with that? Yeah. You OK? Yeah, I'm just, let's just go. Let's go. We don't have a lot of time at this point, and we're feeling very uncomfortable. But we've got to get some readings from the air to see exactly how active this facility is. Our drone is equipped with an HD infrared camera that has a 30 times optical zoom. This will show us everything in this place to a fine detail. Go. Here we go, here we go. Go, 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 There we go, there we go. You OK? No. I'm feeling really. Take a knee, take a knee. I barely get the drone off the ground, and suddenly Ken's doubling over. I have no idea what's going on with him. Like, my stomach is in knots. Man, I, I'm sorry, dude. I got to go. We got to go. I'm bringing it home. This has all the marks of a stomach bug. Maybe it's something that Ken ate. The fact that we are right outside of heart may be affecting Ken's subconscious and making this way worse. Don't lean against me. I don't feel right, man. Hold on, hold on. We got to get this down. It's not cooperating. It's just hanging up there. I'm having trouble controlling the drone. It's like something's interfering with the signal. <laughs> Hang in there, Ken. This drone has been through a lot, so there might just be a glitch going on. But at this point, I don't really care why things are happening. I want to get Ken out of here for his own sake. <laughs> it's almost down. It's almost down. OK. All right, it's down. I can come back for it. Let's oh, get wait. you to the car. I'm here. I'm here. Come on. Stand up. Come on. <laughs> Tommy! Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What's going on? Come on, how am I getting in the car? This is not what I thought would happen tonight. We have no choice. We have to abort this mission now. Let's get out of here. Come on, let's go. While investigating the Harp facility near Gakona, Alaska, Ken Gerhardt started feeling ill. I don't feel right, man. Back for it. Let's oh, get you the car. I'm here. I'm here. Come on. Stand up. After a long night battling nausea and severe anxiety, he decides to seek medical help. Knowing what I now know about HARP and their ability to affect the human mind, I'm worried that my symptoms might be caused by something being a little off mentally. So I'm seeing Curtis Walton, an expert in neurofeedback. Uh, you can take a seat right here. Neurofeedback is a therapy that helps the brain regulate the well-being of the body. If HARP messed me up, Curtis Walton is the guy that can help me out. Last night had like a major anxiety event and it, it triggered kind of a nausea and I couldn't sleep at all. I mean, I'm kind of wrecked at this point. What I do is it can help with calm you down, yeah. all right? Um, neurofeedback, it deals with the brain electricity. It starts regulating what the symptoms you came in for. Using electrodes to measure Ken's brain activity Curtis will present a series of images and sounds that guide Ken's brain waves back to optimal levels. T4 minus. I'm going to start at uh, 5 millihertz. The lower the frequency, the faster and the better the results. We worked our way down to 0.1 millihertz. Because we're at such a low frequency, it helps. It's what helps in the calming down, the regulation. So, how are you feeling right now? I'm feeling very serene. My anxiety is, it's gone. I mean, it's, okay. yeah, I feel much so, better. This process is pretty amazing, and it makes you realize how easily your mind can be manipulated. Doesn't it make sense that governments might try to weaponize this? Do you think it's possible that my brain could have actually been affected by these magnetic bursts of energy? They got therapy out there called transcranial stimulation. Okay. It works wonders for depression. They pump magnetic waves into you, you know, correctly, it works great, but anything incorrectly will cause problems. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, involves placing a magnetic coil near the patient's head and sending calculated magnetic impulses into their brain. TMS can alter mood, affect the ability to speak, and even trigger physical movements of the extremities. If those results can be achieved with a single coil, what is possible with a massive antenna array? Thanks again so much. No problem. You've done wonders for me. Hearing Curtis talk about this technology has me convinced that heart could have caused my breakdown. The ability of their technology to affect the human mind poses a real threat. The thought of mind control is an ongoing fear for Nicole Dennis after a life-changing experience in her youth. A few years ago, um, I was home with my older brother uh, in my kitchen. We were just washing dishes, and all of a sudden, I got this screaming pain in my head. Just out of nowhere, this loud pounding, and it hurt so badly, I dropped what I was doing, and I just grabbed my head, hoping it would stop. And then I looked and noticed my brother was experiencing the same thing. It was terrifying. And then after a few seconds, it stopped. And I asked my brother what that was, but he didn't answer. He just quietly walked out of the house. And he never returned. He wouldn't have just left us. Something changed in that day. I am so terrified that it's going to happen to me. Based on Ken's extreme experience near Harp, Jack sets up a meeting with another possible victim named Wes that he found through a support group online. Hey, how you doing? Jax wants to see if there's any sort of pattern to these attacks. So tell me a little bit what you got going on. I mean, uh, 
You're involved with these support groups, right? Uh, for TIs, targeted individuals uh -huh. dealing with uh, covert uh, harassment from the government. You know, back when I was a teenager, I had an experience. I had this bomb go off in my head. It was almost this, this throbbing, pounding feeling. And I fell to the floor, and you almost go blank. It's like this blackout state. You just kind of disappear. Wes's comments about being in a trance or zombie-like state made me immediately think about Stephanie, and how she wandered up that mountain before she went missing. Have you ever been in that state and then ended up somewhere physically that you weren't? It almost feels like sleepwalking. That's, I mean, that just must feel insane it's, when you come out of it, right? It's retracing the steps to figure out what you've done and where you've been. So how do you deal with your symptoms? Uh, we wear protective hats. Uh, they look just like normal. Like what you're wearing right now? Yeah. Can I see it? Yeah. Is that a foil? Yeah. OK. When Wes showed me his tinfoil hat, I got to be honest. I was thinking, what is going on here? And, and you feel it works pretty well? Yeah. It makes me, you know, it's like a security blanket almost. Gotcha. Yeah. People think we're crazy, but we're not crazy. He really feels that having tinfoil in his hat protects him from having his mind controlled and other signals going into his head. What do you know about Harp? I know that a lot of the guys in the uh, in the support group for TIs have been talking about Harp, and they believe that that has something to do with everything that's been going on with us. These guys are convinced that Harp is doing terrible things, but all this talk of wearing tinfoil hats and mind control is just a little too science fiction for me. Have you ever been up to the facility? I haven't. I'm too scared. As much as I'd like to write this guy off, I've done enough interviews to know that the fear in his eyes is real. He definitely feels like he's under attack. The team's investigation into HARP has uncovered some frightening possibilities. That's how mind control works, man. Electromagnetic energy affects everything from electronics. He's not cooperating, he's just hanging up there. To our physical health. Like, my stomach is in knots. It's almost done. Is the facility manipulating this energy to target individuals? Are some of the Northern Lights a reflection of Harp's covert deeds? Local resident Shayla Altus believes she witnessed one of these evil deeds firsthand. I live in Gakona with my husband. Um, that's where Harp is. One night, we were watching a movie, and after it finished, um, he said he was going to go outside and move the trash cans down to the street. I heard this banging and noises outside, and it was my husband. He was yelling like he was about to fight someone, but there was nobody there. I banged on the window, but he didn't respond at all. And he kept throwing the trash cans at some invisible enemy. And I grabbed him um, to try to break through, and his eyes were completely glazed over. I was so scared. Um, it's really not like him. I was finally able to calm him down and get him back in the house. But in the morning, he didn't, he didn't remember anything. He just said he had a really, really bad headache. Okay, how you feeling? Ah, uh, man, I'm feeling 100% better, guys. We had us worried. Something weird was going on at that facility. After having to abort their drone investigation of Harp because of Ken's sudden illness, the team has decided to take a much bolder approach. They're going to fly over the Harp facility in a helicopter, looking for stronger proof that Harp is active and dangerous. You be all right going back there? Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm anxious to fly over and see how close we can get. We definitely don't want to get in trouble, especially where the government's concerned. But the area around Harp is public airspace, so we're going to use that to our advantage and see what we can learn. Well, here we go. It's our ride. Yes, sir. Hold up here, guys. Let's make so, sure we have everything. K2 meter, Geiger counter. Magnetometer, yeah, we got it covered, man. I'm gonna be able to take all kinds of readings with this stuff. You know I met with Wes, right? He's had his mind controlled. Yeah, well, one of the things he showed me was that he lines his hats and clothing with tinfoil. He says it works. Really? I gotta admit, this is very hokey, but I got us all tinfoil. I'm totally aware that the tinfoil hat is a cliche, 
In my experience, there are some people with mental health issues that do feel like radio waves are coming into their brain and they possibly might be having mind control. But in this type of unknown situation and given what happened to Ken, why not be fully prepared? Aluminum foil does reflect radiation, as anyone knows who's accidentally put it in a microwave. So why not give it a shot? We're all set? It's a very clear night. Perfect conditions under which to fly over the heart facility. This way we can take some really in-depth readings and tell whether or not the heart facility is still active. Still a little nervous, but feeling much better than the other night. That was pretty scary, man. This is the very first time I've ever flown in a helicopter at night, and honestly, it's very unsettling, particularly knowing that we're going to be flying over the HARP facility in a covert operation. How far are we from HARP here? We're about five miles out right now. I can get you uh, pretty close. We probably won't be able to fly right over it. It's entirely different up here at night. It's hard to make out your bearings where you're at. I, I don't know which way we're going. Hey, guys, look, look. Wow. Seeing the Aurora Borealis at night from a helicopter is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But it's also strange because I'm not sure what it is at this point. Is this something metaphysical like legends say, or something natural like scientists say, or maybe something man-made by heart? Uh, we're actually coming up on it right now. There it hey, is. there it is. This is pretty much as close as we're going to be able to get. Wow. Very ominous, though. I mean, look at the way it's just kind of standing out here in the middle of nowhere. Flying over a top secret facility, we're not going to have a lot of time. We've got to get our readings quickly and get out of here. I'm going to bring on the K2. Take some uh, measurements here, Jack. So you help me out with the uh, documentation? Yes, sir. The K2 EMF reader is the quickest way to see if there's any electromagnetism coming from this facility. This will tell us if HARP is active or not. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's crazy. Right up. Up. We are definitely getting massive readings. Massive reading on the K2. Electromagnet. Hey, look, it's redlining, guys. Yeah. See that? Taking out, I see that, yeah. Here, Whoa. Down. What's happening? Cool. Something's wrong. Keep this going on. I'm not sure. We definitely have a disturbance of some sort going on here. Holy cow. Holy crap. Keep this going on. As they attempt to fly over the Hart facility, the team suddenly experiences some frightening trouble with their chopper. We definitely have a disturbance of some sort going on here. We need to get out of here, guys. Yeah. Oh. Holy cow. Holy crap. Oh. Holy cow. Look at the compass. It's all over the place. It's not right. I think it's time to get out of here, guys. Yeah, this, this, this doesn't feel right, man. Now, what's going on? More than turbulence. Okay, let me get it under control here first. Okay, I got it here. We're going to go ahead and head on out of here. Oh, good deal. Yes. You have some sweaty palms, guys. Man, my stomach's upside down right now. Yeah. You all right, Ken? Yeah. Um, that was weird. That was really, really weird. I think we have enough data now where we can uh, definitely make some determinations. That was utterly terrifying. Right as I was getting strong EMF readings from HARP, our helicopter pilot lost control. We know that electromagnetic waves can affect or damage instruments on a helicopter, so maybe that's what was going on. All that matters is the pilot regain control of the craft, and I'm glad to be back on the ground safe and sound. Between the readings and the way the helicopter was malfunctioning, no. something's going on. This place is supposed to be shut down, guys. What we felt tonight and what we saw the other day with Ken, this place is not shut down. Yeah, definitely not. Something's going on. Our EMF readings strongly suggest that the heart facility is still active, despite the fact that they're telling us that the facility's been shut down. 
And when you consider our experience on the helicopter, it suggests that there's something more going on than what the public knows. These government facilities are covert, and they may be working on something that we may never get concrete proof of. Whatever the team just experienced, at least it didn't involve mind control this time. You guys okay? He's glad to be on the ground. We're on the ground, we're okay. <laughs> that was crazy. How you feeling, Ken? You're looking a little yellow in there. Oh, imagine if I didn't have the tinfoil. You know, I'm a little bit rattled right now. That was a wild ride. Yeah, you're the Alaska native. I mean, how do you feel about this harp stuff? Well, um, it is our belief that, that um, the aurora, the lights, are, are the spirits that have gone before us, and that they're sending us messages. But with the readings that we got and our equipment today, um, I think the modern technology could be replicating the ancient phenomenon in a dangerous way. Let's consider the facts. We know that HARP is broadcasting waves into the ionosphere. They are essentially creating geomagnetic anomalies. I mean, we experienced that tonight. Mm -hmm. They're trying to essentially recreate the aurora borealis. Right. And that there's so many possible things that they can, you know, achieve with that. They're beaming frequencies back at the Earth that could be used for, you know, weather control or mind control or, you know, all kinds of crazy things. They're saying that they're doing it for defense, for communications, for all these beneficial things, to check the ozone. But um, chaos theory dictates that one tiny stimulus can create all types of side effects or chain reactions that are completely beyond our comprehensions. The other side of it, you got to know China and Russia are all involved in this kind of stuff. So if we're not doing it and working on it, then the technology is going to another country. And we gotta, gotta look at it on that side too. For me, the harp technology is a lot like the nuclear weapons race. If someone else has a bomb, the best way to protect yourself is for you to have a bomb. We may never know because they're not giving any answers. What began as an investigation into the Northern Lights ends as a potential international conspiracy. It's long been known that strange behaviors can be caused by electrical imbalances in the brain. It now seems possible those glitches can be caused by government technology. The team personally experienced high electromagnetic signals from HARP, as well as frightening occurrences near the facility. But as long as governments hold secrets, we may never know if they're the reason so many go missing in Alaska.